The approach to the study of essential biochemical pathways pioneered by Beadle and Tatum in the early 1940s was so useful that it didn't take long for researchers to identify genes involved in many essential biochemical pathways, including the synthesis of the vitamins thiamine, peroxidine, inosol, and choline, and the amino acids tryptophan, lysine, thiamine, thalene, methionine, and arginine. Genes involved in fatty acid and nucleic acid synthesis were also identified. As more and more mutant strains of Neurospora crassa were generated, researchers were able to accumulate multiple strains requiring the same nutrients for growth. Having multiple strains opened up new areas of research on the genetic basis of these biochemical pathways. The work of Serban Horowitz on arginine requiring mutants is an often cited example of how the ability to create multiple mutations within specific biochemical pathways allowed researchers to deepen our understanding of how these pathways were structured. Serban Horowitz's 1944 paper called The Ornithine Cycle in Neurospora and Its Genetic Control reported on work they did with 15 strains that required arginine in order to grow. These are oxytrophic strains, that is, mutant strains with a nutritional requirement not present in the wild type. The nutritional requirement in this case was arginine. These were also referred to as arginine-less strains, indicating they needed arginine to grow. This paper illustrates the way researchers can combine the availability of oxytrophic strains with some understanding of biochemistry to gain insights into the number of steps involved in the synthesis of specific essential nutrients, identify precursors in biochemical pathways, and determine the order of some of the synthesis steps. This work also illustrates two techniques that were pioneered around this time and have since become widely used. They are complementation testing and rescue. The first, complementation testing, involves comparing oxytrophic strains with similar nutrient requirements to determine how many different genes had been disrupted. This is necessary because as more and more strains were identified, it became more and more likely that some of them contained mutations in the same genes. To determine the number of unique mutations, Serban Horowitz took advantage of a feature of Neurospora biology which allowed them to combine the genomes of different strains. Under the proper culture conditions, two strains of Neurospora, in this case two strains that require arginine, can be grown in such a way that they merge to form heterokaryons. That is, a multinucleated cell containing DNA from both strains. The presence of DNA from both strains in this culture meant that all of the genes from strains A and B were present in all of the cells of the mixed strain. Having two copies of all genes made this strain similar to the way diploid cells behave given that they receive one allele from each parent. These mixed strains allowed Serban Horowitz to determine if any of the strains contained mutants in the same gene, because if the same gene was disrupted in both strains, then the resulting heterokaryon would have two copies of the defective gene, meaning it would not have a functional copy. Like each of the individual strains, the multinucleated cells would not be able to grow in minimal media. In terms of complementation, we say the two strains failed to complement. If, on the other hand, each strain had a mutation in a different gene, then the multinucleated cells would have at least one functional copy of all genes needed to synthesize arginine and would be able to grow in minimal media. In this case, we say the two mutations were able to complement each other. By creating multinucleated cells with all 15 of the original arginine-less strains, Serban Horowitz determined that they had disrupted only seven unique genes. The other eight strains were repeat disruptions of one of these seven. This technique of complementation testing remains common today. When using organisms like Neurospora, where heterokaryons can be created, complementation testing is done as described above. When working with diploid organisms, the technique is performed by mating the strains and looking at the phenotypic patterns of the offspring. The other technique illustrated by the Serb and Horowitz work on arginine biosynthesis is rescue. This has actually been described in an earlier video because it is essentially what Beadle and Tatum did in their original work, and in the work Serban Horowitz did to find the original 15 arginine oxytrophs. In this earlier work, what they did was take strains that were able to grow with an addition of a mix of amino acids and test the, these strains with individual amino acids to determine which was required for growth. In the case of the Serban Horowitz work, all of the strains required arginine. Another way to say this is that they were all rescued by arginine. By combining the availability of seven arginine-requiring oxytrophs with some knowledge of arginine biosynthesis, Serb and Horowitz were able to modify the rescue technique to undercover more details about arginine biosynthesis. 
The starting point of this part of their work was the knowledge that the synthesis of essential biochemical products involved the cell using some precursor molecule or substrate which undergoes one or more chemical transformations until an end product is produced and that each step in this process requires specific enzymes, enzymes which are controlled by genes that had been disrupted in oxytrophic mutants. What was not known was how many steps there were in the synthesis process, what intermediate molecules were involved, or in what order the steps occurred. To address these questions, Serban Horowitz hypothesized that the amino acids citrulline and or ornithine, both of which had structures similar to arginine, may be precursors of arginine in the synthesis process. As with most of this work, they tested their hypotheses by manipulating culture conditions. They took the seven unique strains as determined by complementation testing and grew them under the following conditions. Base media alone, base media plus arginine, base media plus citrulline, and base media plus ornithine. Since these are all arginine oxytrophs, the result of the first two conditions are easy to predict. In the base media, the wild type strain will grow, but the absence of arginine prevents any growth by the mutant strains. Growth should be expected in all of the tubes with added arginine because this was the condition used to identify the strains in the first place. The real question was what was going to happen in the conditions amended with suspected precursors to arginine. In the media plus citrulline treatment, six out of the seven strains grew. In the base media plus ornithine treatment, four of the seven oxytrophic strains grew. These results allowed Serban Horowitz to bin the strains into three groups. Four strains in group one were able to grow with the addition of arginine, citrulline, and ornithine. The second group contained two strains, which grew on arginine and citrulline, but not on ornithine. And the final strain was in its own group, which only grew on arginine. The separation of the seven arginine oxytrophs into three distinct groups based on the ability of different compounds to rescue them was then combined with knowledge of biochemistry allowing Serban Horowitz to use patterns in the rescue data to develop a more complete description of the process by which Neurospora synthesizes the amino acid arginine. First, the fact that the citrulline and ornithine were able to rescue any of the strains supported the researcher's hypotheses that both of these compounds were precursors in the biosynthesis of arginine. Further, the fact that the group 3 strain was rescued by arginine but not by citrulline or ornithine indicates that the gene mutated in this strain is involved in a step close to the end of the synthesis process. This same logic can be used to determine the relative position of citrulline and ornithine in the pathway. Group 2 mutants are rescued by arginine and citrulline, but not by ornithine, indicating that the genes disrupted in the group 2 strains are involved in transforming a precursor of citrulline into citrulline. The ability of citrulline to rescue these strains but not ornithine suggests that citrulline is closer to the end of the pathway than ornithine. Consistent with this, citrulline was able to rescue all of the mutant strains, meaning genes disrupted in the group 1 strains are involved in converting some other compound into ornithine which can then be processed into citrulline and then arginine. These rescue experiments gave scientists insight into what compounds were precursors to arginine in the biosynthesis pathway, the order in which intermediate compounds were produced, and identified individual genes involved in different steps in the process. These findings reinforced the one gene, one enzyme hypothesis that came out of the earlier work by Beetle and Tatum, a hypothesis which was subsequently modified to one gene, one peptide, when additional research showed that individual genes encoded for single peptides and that many enzymes were made up of multiple peptides working in unison. Combining complementation testing, rescue experiments, and newer techniques have allowed scientists to further describe the steps in the synthesis of arginine and identify genes responsible for each step. These techniques have not only been applied to arginine. Over time, scientists have been able to apply similar approaches to explore the synthesis of many other essential biochemical compounds.